Last week, I discussed a little about whether birds can become dependent on bird feeders or not, and now in this video, I'd like to highlight some of the negatives and positives of backyard bird feeding, and what we can do to improve upon the negatives to make the experience better for not only ourselves, but the birds too. A lot of the information I will be sharing comes from a Q&A that was done a while back about why we feed birds and if we should be doing it. Experts in this area, Australian scientist and author of The Birds at My Table, Why We Feed Wild Birds and Why It Matters, Daryl Jones, and Emma Grigg, who leads Project Feeder Watch and consulted the 2015 book Feeding Wild Birds in America, answered some questions about the positive and negative impacts of feeding birds. Before I start, I'd like to share a few fun facts about bird feeding. It wasn't always like it is in recent years, with many people hanging up feeders in their backyard. It did take place, however nowhere near on the level that it is now. Feeding wild birds became more widespread in the late 1880s, which seems to be thanks to a book that was published around that time, titled Through an Opera Glass by Florence Merriam-Webster. It was one of the first popular field guides back then, and promoted the use of modern bird feeders. However, buying wild bird food at local stores as we do now wasn't really a thing. That luxury never really started to take off until the early 1980s. Prior to this convenience, people instead would toss out food scraps or leftover grain. Interestingly, but not surprising, it was the caged bird industry who first started selling to people to feed wild birds. Now this hobby was being done all year round. Today, the bird feeding industry is pretty darn big. In just the US alone, $4 billion a year is spent on feeders and bird seed. And it's still growing, but apparently at a smaller rate. Since it's such a widespread hobby in our current time, it causes one to wonder what kind of an impact backyard feeders are having on birds. As with most things, there are some positives and negatives. One especially obvious impact is that feeders help to increase a bird's survival during harsh conditions, like heavy snowfall or during cold snaps. Another way it helps them is by replacing food sources that have been destroyed by development. Feeders can also give a much needed energy boost to migrating birds stopping along the way. It's clear that birds, especially ones in urban areas, benefit from the food we put out, particularly when it's good quality food like black oil sunflower seeds or something fatty like suet. In the Q&A, Emma made a very good point on how reliant birds become on feeders. There really is no reliable food source for most birds, so they are used to flying around trying to seek food, knowing that they can't ever really count on anything. Luckily, birds know how to plan for that. She likes to think of bird feeders more like a supplement. So for those worried they are making birds dependent by having feeders up, that doesn't seem to be the case. They will still search for and find other energy sources if need be. And most birds not only eat seeds, but insects, berries, and even small vertebrates. There is an interesting thing happening since bird feeders became a huge hobby too. The data that has been collected over the years seems to suggest that since bird feeding grew to the level that it is currently, some bird species have actually been expanding their range north, such as red-bellied woodpeckers, Carolina wrens, Anna's hummingbirds, and northern cardinals, to name a few. These birds are starting to be seen in colder, more northern places. Even birds like sharp-shinned hawks, who regularly take advantage of backyard bird feeders to find prey, have been benefiting. One study found that sharp shin hawks on the East Coast were less likely to migrate due to the abundance of bird feeders. Migrating is a gamble for birds, so by not having to migrate, they aren't risking the many dangers that can arise, from bad weather to exhaustion and starvation. The larger lookalike to the sharp shin hawk, the Cooper's hawk, also readily takes advantage of backyard feeders, resulting in a significant increase in population in urban areas. Just 50 years ago, no one considered the Cooper's hawk to be an urban bird. What's more is that some studies have found that urban hawks are feeding heavily on non-native birds, such as European starlings, house sparrows, and pigeons, so they could actually reduce competition for native songbirds. Another positive thing is that due to so many people participating in backyard bird feeding in recent years, a lot of these individuals get involved with Project Feeder Watch a winter-long survey of birds that visit feeders at backyards, nature centers, community areas, and other locations in the U.S. and Canada. 
This is important because it helps researchers collect information about bird population biology, enabling scientists to piece together the most accurate population maps and monitor more than 100 bird species that winter in North America. It should be said though that you don't need a feeder to participate in this project. All you really need is an area with plantings, habitat, water, or food that attracts birds. Of course, there is negative impacts of feeding birds too. Anyone familiar with bird feeding will know that the risk of spreading disease is pretty big if you don't go about bird feeding properly. With so many birds coming to one location to feed, the likelihood of a sick bird showing up is pretty high. When that happens, the disease can spread to other birds, and if left alone, it can cause a lot of devastation. We are responsible for making their experience at our feeders a good one. That means keeping the feeders clean as well as the area around and if need be, taking down feeders for a while after seeing a sick bird so that the disease can't spread any further. Be kind and respectful of those beautiful guests that are visiting your feeders. Just as you would make sure everything is right when inviting friends over for a meal, apply that same level of thinking to our feathered friends. It's paramount to the fitness and health of our wild birds that we realize the scale and implications of feeding them. It's not just my feeder in my own backyard, it's part of a network across the whole landscape, so we have to take responsibility for what we are doing. With all of that said, don't get discouraged and quit bird feeding. That's not the message. Instead, take your bird feeding hobby more seriously and keep things sanitary. Another problem for feeder birds is an increased threat of being preyed on, as I already mentioned about the hawks. I mean, look at it from their perspective. Many birds in one spot almost every day, of course they are going to take advantage. There are other predators to consider though, cats, which can be a big problem. I'm not hating on our furry friends. It's not their fault. They are just acting instinctively when preying on birds. It really comes down to us either keeping cats indoors or only allowing them outside on a leash and in the owner's company. But if you are of the mind that they must run wild, there are collars that can be used to at least reduce or limit cats from successfully getting a bird. Wild birds already have enough working against them. For one of those things to be a cat is sad really because the birds are more often than not just left there dead. It's not like when a bird of prey catches one. Another negative impact is window collisions. I cannot stress how important this one is. Just like how unnecessary and avoidable the whole cat problem can be, window collisions too can be avoided. Daniel Clem Jr., a professor at Muhlenberg College, has spent his career researching window collisions. He discovered that birds are killed most frequently at windows 15 to 30 feet from a feeder, and that birds can build up enough momentum to kill themselves if they leave a perch as close as 3 feet from a window. It seems that the kills drop to virtually zero when feeders are less than three feet away. So that should help you to determine where to place your feeders to eliminate mortality rate should a bird collide with a window. Another really, really great thing to do is to put decals on the outside of the window or use mosquito screens. There are many places online where you can find these and they are supposed to work really well. So what's the verdict? Well, based on everything I went over, I think bird feeders are great if done properly. We can easily avoid transmission of disease by keeping feeders clean and taking feeders down for a while if we see a sick bird or if predators become too much of a problem. Window collisions can be avoided too, as can most outdoor cats. As for the worry of making them dependent on feeders, birds are very good and used to seeking out food sources in their area. I talked more about this in last week's video and will link it at the end for those who missed it. If you follow these steps to make sure you're providing a good experience for your backyard birds, well, I'd say keep feeding them. After all, it is great enjoyment for many people and can help the little guys get through bad winters. What are some of your thoughts? Are there any pros and cons that I've missed? Comment below and let me know. And as always, thanks a bunch for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned some new things. Take care. Happy birding.